Hello everybody. I, to this day, am still John Atack, um, though you never know what might happen during the next hour. Uh, I'll probably still be John Atack at the end, but I have written my name down on a slate for those of you who are fans of Alice Wonderland so that I can remember who I am at the end. And anyway, this is my, my dear, esteemed friend and colleague, Joe Zimhart. Hi, Joe. Hello, John. Thanks for having me again. Always a pleasure. Yeah, same here. Yeah. And, and you're going to in introduce our topic rather than me doing the usual 10 minute waffle before anybody else gets a word in edge ways. Yeah, let me let me try to do this. Uh, this is a big topic. Mm. And, um, you know, I I'll ask a question, but don't answer it. Um, you know, what is dog spelled backwards? Right? So, as I was talking to you about, I had this book that I gave my mother back in 1991 when I got a publication from the author, uh, sent it to me. And, and this is the book, and it's titled, What Do We Mean When We Say God? No. And Deirdre Sullivan did a, uh, a survey around the nation and also looking at famous people that, that answered this question. So there's, there's common uh, you know, answers from, from people who... Uh, uh, you know, like, for instance, this this eight year old, you know, from uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And her answer was, God is like the light I turn on in my room. He lets me see what's there. Now, Heidegger couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> but that's an eight year old. OK, so let, let me go through some more of these and then. Uh, Please. Uh, so. Here we have, if there were no God, it would be necessary to invent him. Voltaire. Yep. Right? Um, let's keep going here. Two things hold me in awe. The starry heaven above me and the moral law within me. Now, you know who that is. That's Immanuel Kant. Mm. Right? Um, is one of the most famous saying. I think it might be his, uh, in his obituary. Uh, Anyway, the energy of atheists, their tireless propaganda, their spirited discourses testify to a belief in God which puts to shame mere lip worshippers. They are always thinking of God. Fulton J. Sheen. And it is easier to think of the world without a creator than of a creator loaded with all the contradictions of the world. Simone de Beauvoir. Yeah. Uh, let's move on here. So, man is certainly stark mad. He cannot make a worm, and yet he will be making gods by the dozens. <laughs> Jean Paul Marat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I see God everywhere. People want him to be. If you are in that part of God's kingdom that says Muhammad is the interface between you and God, and you want to have a conversation with God, He's there for you. He's there for us all. Dwayne Lundgren, age 53, a deputy director of U.S. Army Intelligence. <laughs> and uh, God is from whom we may not get what we want, but do find peace with what we get. Marilyn White, 58, lives in Chicago. Okay. When we talk to God, we're praying. When God talks to us, we're schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> Lily Lily Tomlin, age 51, actress, Los Angeles. The blessed Lily Tomlin, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and in my most extreme fluctuations, I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. Charles Darwin. Hmm. Yeah, that's an important one. Yeah. Because he's often acquired by the atheist camp. and Very much so, yeah. Was... Yeah, he... Uh, he had said in one statement that as far as a designer or a god, uh, he chose to wave a white flag. He mm. wasn't going to fight the idea. No. And that, there's nice. a, a personal letter that he wrote to a friend where, where he took his supporter, Thomas Huxley's word agnostic, and mm. said, that defines my position. Interesting. And people right, have said, well, that's just because his wife was, a, you know, a hardcore Christian and he didn't right. want to upset her. But I think in his private letters, he probably wouldn't have been too worried about upsetting her. And it's, it's a position I take myself. You know, I'm agnostic. I do not know. 
Yeah. And I do not know that I do not know. Mm. And there are known <laughs> un Rumsfelds and Rumsfeld right. unknowns, no, unknowable Rumsfelds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's one you'll like. <laughs> this speaks to our field. God is the electromagnetic field surrounding the earth out of which everything is composed. Gabriel Green, age 65, president of Amalgamated Flying Saucer Clubs of America. <laughs> well, he'd know. <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> he would know, yeah. Yeah, he would know. He's the president after all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And this one, a uh, famous author, uh, God is a fire and you must walk on it, dance on it. At that moment, the fire will become cool water. But until you reach that point, what a struggle, my Lord, what an agony. Nikos Katsazakis. Zorba the Greek. Yes, dancing on the fire. Mm. Okay, I'm just going to do two more. Yep. Okay, no one has ever died an atheist. And that's Plato. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now above Plato, this will be my last one, this person says, anybody can say they found God. It's a personal experience they're talking about. The problem is with any human statement is that it's in a context, and the context can always be examined. If the context doesn't reflect the high purposes and the high values and claims that the person is making about their experiences of God, then you've got a problem. Uh -huh. And that was by Joe Simhart, age 42, deprogrammer, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I've heard of him. Yeah. So, you know, he's listed right above Plato here, which is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason I sent this book to my yeah. mother back in 1991 when it came out. It was published by Doubleday. And uh, there's a series of these kinds of books out there that are kind of small things you read while you're sitting on the commode or whatever and uh, table chatter. Uh, but but yeah, it's compiled by Dear D. Sullivan. So there you go. Hmm. I've opened up a uh, a flood of ideas, I hope. And uh, yeah, well, I've but, written nearly a whole really, page of notes I, I, listening. I went to my my quote at the end. Is is this has basically been my approach about this whole problem of cults and whether they're good or bad or God or whatever. I'm not questioning the right of people to believe in that sort of thing or whether it's real or not. You know, what I'm questioning is how it's used. So yeah. so that's the pragmatist approach is how is it used in social discourse? How is it used in a sentence? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, so, yeah, you know, th th this whole concept of the deity, uh, the source of all things, the universe, mm -hmm. um, seems to me to be more than not the main attraction of why people are drawn to a prophet a guru uh, a, a new psychology uh you know some inner deep answer that they're they're seeking to that transcendent idea yes so anything uh trigger your <laughs> your brilliant mind or your your impish mind impish uh, probably yeah. more likely um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's a topic of endless fascination to me. When I was 13, I asked our religious instruction teacher um, if anybody other than Methodists would go to heaven because he was a Methodist and he paused and to my amazement and it was an Anglican school. He said, no, only Methodists will go to heaven. And that made me a bit suspicious. And the next week I said to him, could God ever forgive the devil? And I don't know where this came from. I hadn't thought about mm -hmm. it. It just came out of my mouth. and. He said no, and something changed in me. I'd mm -hmm. grown up in the Anglican faith. I kind of believed it. At 11, I stopped going to church because I wanted to sleep in on a Sunday morning because I have a sleep disorder, you know. But my mum took it that I was moving away from the faith and never had a conversation with me about it. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped going to church, and then it, I didn't want to be confirmed in the Anglican church. All three of my older brothers were. And I just, it just didn't feel right somehow. And at 13, I went, well, the God they are believing in, I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Because I went to a nominally Christian school in a nominally Christian country where our head of state, our monarch, is also the head of the church. Um, right. Something that the American Constitution wouldn't allow for, I don't think. Uh, and I found that I was in a school where 
and and it was a, it was a relatively prestigious school like you know it wasn't i wasn't paying fees but there were boys who were uh, or their parents were and on the one hand we were being told we needed to imitate christ we needed to behave like christ you know mm-hmm. uh, so i kind of looked at, at, at the gospels and it, you know he who would follow me um must give all that he owns to the poor and i took that as you know he meant that right. <laughs> and yet what I was actually being taught alongside the imitation of Christ was to become a rapacious capitalist and that, that really success in the world is, you know, he with the best toys wins. Um, or, or is blessed by God. Yeah, is blessed by God. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, Joseph Campbell points out that, that, you know, when he went searching to prove the Jungian unconscious, the collective unconscious, because all of these stories emerge all around the world. So in his first significant book um, hero with a thousand faces in the 1940s he sadly bursts the jungian myth and says no we can trace the root of these stories and what happened is that in sumeria somebody got the idea of this divine presence that would then be channeled through them their king the person in charge and that's how our society has worked ever since it doesn't have to there are societies like the indus valley Mahanjadaro civilization that lasted for 700 years, as far as we can tell, without religion, without kings, and without warfare. Well, but but they had um, Catholic gods, meaning earthbound gods, like yes. the water, thunder, Agni, yeah, the, one the of the spirit, most ancient gods, was a fire god. And, which, and, which, which brings yeah. us into how God was invented, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, I, Machir Eliade's work on that, though there is a little bit of an odd human being, as was Joseph Campbell. Yeah, I, I think I think what we tend to think in the West of God is is, is what's been known as a sky god, hmm. and, and that, that Mahanjadaro culture was taken over by the 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 Aryans that came in from Persian area, who brought their sky gods with them, and and they adapted a sky god named Indra uh, from the Greek model of hmm. Zeus which yeah. spread around the area. And so uh, that's how India got its sky gods. And yeah. Indra was the primary uh, Zeus-like character that went and do- now was male and dominated the earth gods, which tended to be female or neutral. Yeah, in, in and, cases, and often yeah. came in threes. Yeah, yes. yes. So, so, I mean, Robert Gray's hypothesis was that the, the Greek myths show the movement of a patriarchal culture taking over a matriarchal mm-hmm. culture. So the stories are about some... Perseus or whoever defeating three women okay. and whenever we get those threes we're looking it would seem at a matriarchy which possibly existed for hundreds of thousands of years prior to this patriarchal push which you know, we're we're seeing in our own time hopefully the tail end of that you know gender enmity you know hopefully that there are people who are understanding that we shouldn't have male versus female we should have male and female working together. Well, you know, I, I would think even in the origins, uh, th- there was no distinction between matriarchal and patriarchal when it came to the the forces, the gods of nature. You know, I, I don't think the thunder god was necessarily matriarchal. I don't, th- or, or patriarchal. I don't think the, uh, you know, al- although when you look at early astrology, it was it was mostly moon centered, not sun centered. Mm. In, in the Canaanite culture and uh, where, where it originated. And and so moon has been associated with the feminine, mm. in, uh, no matter where you go, and, and mm. because of menstrual cycle and all that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and and the, the idea that, that that somehow we emerge, we emerge from the night and we emerge from wombs, which are night, which are dark, mm. um, and the moon shines in the night. You know, this kind of association, I think, is was just common among. Hmm. And there are three men. days of darkness every month. And so, yes, so many myths have the three days involved in them until resurrection occurs. Before you're born again. Right. And right. I mean, for me, it, it's sort of um, I was thinking about uh, Gerald, Gerald Edelman, um, who the neuroscientist who, who he called God the generator of diversity, G.O.D. Mm-hmm. And um but he also, one of the things he said is, is that if you want to understand what the process of evolution is and how it functions, look at the development of the human brain. Look at the, you know, you can see step by step 
what is happening. There's a process one could call natural selection. There's a process of choice, which one could call the equivalent of sexual selection. Then there are the random things that happen around, which we might call epigenetics. And then finally, you have the fourth dimension of evolution, which is cultural transmission. Now, that one, for me, as, you know, we're both of us students of religion. We're both of us people who've been absolutely fascinated by belief, while probably standing a little to one side of belief, because you know the careers we've chosen meant we've had to understand, to some extent, the nature of belief. And to get back to Immanuel Kant, the, the idea that there is a real world around us, but every one of us has our own perception and interpretation of that world. Mm -hmm. So there are as many gods as there are people because, but I think for you and I, what, what's perhaps different is that we don't feel insistent upon converting anybody to our own way of looking at the world. And we are perfectly willing to tolerate, as you said at the beginning, what other people believe, as long mm -hmm. as what they believe doesn't lead them to act in an antisocial fashion. You know, so the thuggies believed that Carly wanted them to garrote people on the road and steal their stuff. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. I think the difference between what we call a cult leader, a malignant cult leader, is someone who cannot abide the possibility of their ideas converging with someone else's mm. that's living. You know, so a, a reasonable person looks for convergence. Now, th it might not be absolute and complete convergence, but we can think alike yeah. about something. And, and that helps us to communicate. And we agree on a term, whether shades of meaning change according to who we are, because we grasp reality according to how this brain is set up. It's just like a bee grasps reality according to its nervous system, the way it's set up, which is completely alien to us. Uh, we don't see the way a bee does. We don't build homes the way a bee does. We don't interact the way they do, which is matriarchal culture. Completely. Well, well, is it a matriarchal culture? I don't know. Is it? I think <laughs> the, the queen bee. I the queen bee was the yeah, it is a misnomer because the queen doesn't is the only bee in the hive that doesn't direct the hive. The, right, right. And, so, so she's kind of a slave to the hive in a way. Well, she's an a aspect. Serving. Yeah, I, there's a, there's a way of looking at a, a bee colonies, ant colonies, termite colonies as being single individuals, yes. composed of many elements, and. The, one of the breakthroughs in in study of honeybees, and of course there are hundreds of different types of bee, and they they don't all hive together. That they're different cultures among bees, but hive bees, it it was found about twenty thirty years ago that when they have to move location, scout bees will go out and find places, and they'll come back and dance, and eventually mm -hmm. a, a location will be chosen by the democratic majority. And so bees have been thought of as the model of dictatorship and fascism are in fact the most perfect democracy. Interesting. So okay. we, we get into strange ideas there. But yeah, oh, there's so much, you know, so much to say, so much to say, so much to say in the words of Well, Dan you know, the, the theosophical people that I was involved with and, 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 uh, and I think Church Universal, some of them taught this as well, that bees, are not native to planet Earth. They were a gift from the gods of Venus. Oh, that's nice of them. Where, where the temperature yeah. is what? An average of 400 degrees hey, centigrade. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You're, the you're bees are made of all. asbestos. And, <laughs> you know, Ron Hubbard said that we've been invaded by the fourth invader force from Venus and the fifth invader force from Mars. And you're going, yeah, really? Not much living on Venus, I wouldn't have thought. Well, but, Rudolf Steiner uh, said that uh, the, the Christ in his ascended state sent the Buddha to Mars to convert the Martians to Buddhism. Wow. This is what? back in 1910. Oh, yeah, you, you can look it up. Yeah, I, I wonder so, how that So that the, went, the people of Mars are him. actually Buddhists. <laughs> so the War of the Worlds is complete nonsense. They're actually all Buddhists. <laughs> yes, yeah, they wouldn't fight. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw in, um, and, and it's the only thing I know by him, and it, it's because my one of my brothers had it on his wall. Um, when I was a kid, there was this little sign, and it says, Dieu me pardonnera, c'est son métier. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, Heinrich Hein, and uh, translated, I believe it means, God will pardon me, it's his job. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, that's one way of looking at it. Then you've got, is it Pascal's wager, that yeah. you 
you might as well believe in God, because if you don't and he exists, you're in trouble. Um, but I'd say, well, it's going to depend on which God you believed in. If you didn't believe that God right. was a spider, then, uh, you know, he who harms the little fly shall fear the spider's enmity, as William Blake said. Right. So I, I asked this question to start that, you know, you know, what does dog spell backwards? Well, mm -hmm. part of the problem I have with with the God thing is, is that a lot of groups and leaders treat God like a dog that they can actually send out through a command. And this is true all over the world. You know, for instance, a, a, a Buddhist might go up on a uh, on, on the mountain where there's a prayer wheel and spin it. And the belief is that that energy, the, those prayers go out and do things, you know, kind of like you might send a dog out, a messenger mm. out to do something because you spun this prayer wheel. Um, and, and this seems to be a very primitive form of, of prayer and communication with the so-called God, I think, that's pervasive. Mm. And it becomes almost a cult in itself when you get something like a new thought cult that believes in affirmations to the extent yes. like the I am did that you could command God's energy and God will have to respond. Mm. You know, it comes from a mistranslation of Isaiah 45, 11 in the Bible, where it says, command ye me and the things of my hands, said the maker. And uh, it, it's, it's in the old King James, but it's a mistranslation. It shouldn't be. It said, how dare you command me is what the mm. translation should be. Mm. <laughs> and, and one and, thinks uh, that that would be more likely all in all, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've so, just... so we, we gain power by believing this, hmm. that we can gather together in prayer, bow down, put our hands up in praise and and urge God, urge our dog to go out and do things for us, hmm. you know, according to the dog's will, of course. But of course, if you allow a dog to do its own will, it won't do much for you at all. And you'll <laughs> have to clean up afterwards. And you will. I'm... Yeah. And you, and you might get arrested because it might have bit somebody out there off its leash. Exactly. So we have to be very careful about. You got to be really beliefs. controlling of this particular god dog thing. You know, you can't just let it do anything it wants. Its mm. own will. You can't allow it to have its own will. Yeah, and and I, it it is caught up in if if we go back to the origins of Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever we're going to call him, then mm -hmm. we find he is born of. Um, uh, the. He comes out of the Babylonian pantheon. He's one of what seventy-two gods, and he's a war god. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, we hear about his brother Bal Marduk uh, as the golden calf in the desert. We hear various things about Astarte or Astaroth or Asherah, who's his mother. Mm -hmm. When we go back to the Babylonian um, ring seals, and so he's part of a community of gods. And the reason that the Habiru or Hebrews pick on him is he's a war god and exodus 11 makes it pretty clear that he's a fairly genocidal creature at that time that he wants them to kill all of the canaanites all of the people they find there man woman and child it's the first record of a genocide in history it probably didn't happen right. but you know there's no evidence that it did uh, there's but, an but there's a wish that it would happen yes and there's a there's a contempt yeah. towards other people, that, that sense of we mm -hmm. are the chosen people, your lives are not worth anything. The mm -hmm. typical dispensing of existence at the end of Lifton's, and, and that's not acceptable. Um, but the reason, he's a war god, and they are warriors, and they, you know, they're Shemites, they're like the Babylonians, like the Arabs, they fight wars. And they then have to keep the name of their God secret. It's only spoken once a year in the Holy of Holies. I'm not sure that anybody knows what it actually is anymore. Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, right, the, right. What, what have you. But the idea is you mustn't let anybody else know the name of your God, because then they can bribe him with gifts of burning pigeons and things like that. So he, Which, what, that's the point that I'm making. You can, you, you, to control this God, you have to expiate its moods you know if, if it's not spitting not not raining uh like the aztecs you have to capture slaves and tear out their living hearts and uh throw them down the temple steps to get chalk to budge to bring mm. the rain or oh, it's you know, hugely we all to bring the sun up or yeah yeah and... which is interesting you know i mean this is this is kind of like a it's a theme and it still exists very much to in today's religions 
um, and, and especially in the cults, it comes out a lot more sharply hmm. in that, that if you do this, you get that, you know, and, and of course, you know, in Scientology, if you do this, pay all this money out and go up the bridge to total freedom, you're going to get that, which is, well, you know, a piece of blue sky or whatever, but, uh, but you're going to get it. Yeah. And, and it, and, and what, what you're, you're getting is, is a magical power mm -hmm. and that, you know, one of the differentiations that's made in religious studies is of course between you have the devotional religions like bhakti yoga where you're worshiping something and hoping to get something back then you have the magical uh, groups where you are seeking to control divine forces um, supernatural forces external mm -hmm. spiritual forces and then you have the mystical path um, which originally was part of the magical path as far as i can work out but as come, mysticism has come to mean the kind of refining of the self, the intellectual process of seeking to find and face the truth. So pure Buddhism starts as very definitely an anti-magical belief mm -hmm. and then turns into this sense of, oh, we have all of these bodhisattvas the, and all of these tulkus who will be reborn. And it becomes, ab you know, in um, Vajrayana, Buddhism in Tibet, it becomes absolutely, you can't separate it from the Bonpo magical tradition. No, no. In fact, you know, it, 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 in some sense, some people in the past have compared that form of Buddhism to Catholicism in its more primitive forms, hmm. you know, where you have the demons and the saints and, and the statues of them and all, all the stories about them. And, and uh, you can invoke the gods and invoke the saints and invoke, you know, and, and so, I mean, this is the part of Catholicism that the, the the more cleaned up aspects of protestantism wanted to reject and and mm. maybe rightfully so you know to the point where uh they become so austere they're practically zen <laughs> like in uh in, in quakerism you know or, yeah or, or, or yeah. the ultra puritans who who yes have no fun fun at all which is you know right. what a dreadful way to go right. and yes i mean there's so many ways into this one of them is you know when i as sort of 17, 18 year old was calling myself a Buddhist and went to a Soto Zen temple and learned to meditate and all this. Uh, I had friends who were involved with the Krishna temple. Um, I knew nothing about that other than George Harrison singing the Hare Krishna mantra in My Sweet Lord, the song he stole from the chiffonier. But we won't, we won't get onto yeah. that chiffonier. He's um, so fine. Yeah. She's so fine, exactly. And... <laughs> um, so I, I didn't know anything about this as far as I was concerned, they were Hindus. And one of them explained to me that I was an impersonalist and he was a personalist. And it took me a while to grasp this idea that he and his friends and Christians and Muslims, Jews, see God as a person. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Buddhism, there's the idea, or we'll say in Taoism, there's the idea of a force, which mm -hmm. Buddhists start to reify and turn into something by calling it buddha mind um with taoism you have this idea that there is everything emerges out of some sort of force but that force has not been reified it's not been turned into something concrete it well remains. basically it's 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 a uh, contentious force because it moves in and out of darkness and light in and out of itself hmm. it, right. it, it, which is interesting it's almost cosmological in terms of how we see the universe today moving in and out of black holes and into light and into darkness you know it's it's, it's an interesting analogy when you think and, about how long ago it appeared yeah i mean i i i was blown when i was 17 and first read a version of the Tao Te Ching. i was just completely blown away because i was not religiously inclined i was very yeah. confused and here was this text which wasn't about what i ought to believe and the thou shalts and thou shalt not it was a speculation about how the universe came into being and what's mm -hmm. going on and this idea of you know i don't know what this thing is so i will call it Tao, mm -hmm. but of course it has no no name and it fascinated me for long enough that i ended up reading more than 60 versions of the Tao, more than 50 commentaries, and making two translations of it over the years, the first of which was terrible, and the more recent one is probably okay. But character by character, going through it, going through commentaries to mm -hmm. seek to understand it, because this is, is more comparable to 
Plato and Aristotle, the, the Greek philosophers, because this is an attempt to understand rather than this, a rule book of, you know, how, how we're supposed to live according to somebody in the Bronze Age. But yeah. did you ever get into the uh, I Ching, the, which is based on Taoism, on the, the, the trigrams, the uh, eight? It, the, uh, well, the, the I Ching works alongside Taoism. It, yes. Yeah. It, it's one of the classics, one of the Jings. And yes, I, I, I read it. I sought to use it predictively because I was about, say, 17. I read um, Jung's statement about it. Right. I, I have that book. Yeah. And and I came to to think that it was a it was um, a philosophical construction. Mm -hmm. that, well, um, I used to, I used to use it back in the day, mm -hmm. right before I got into the cult uh, thing. Didn't you have a coin to flip? Versus. You know. Yeah, you could do the coin. You could do the sticks. You know, you mm -hmm. could do whatever what's fascinating to me about it is that, that that one of the origin stories of it was that that whoever came up with it saw it on the back of a turtle so it is said the, the original hexagrams parts. yeah the original hexagrams um or trigrams I mean, that's, in fact i think originally the trigrams right yeah and and uh uh which makes me think that we we can't easily stay in that cloud of unknowing you know just the Tao itself we need to dumb it down we need to make trigrams we need to and, and, you know and Taoism is full of gods and goddesses and whatever and it's oh it's it, 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 like Buddhism they're, they're, yeah they're, exactly the movement so, so for founded. some reason we have to dumb that down we have to come out of the cloud of unknowing which is one of the famous uh, uh doctrines Christian in, in, text, in Christian yeah. mysticism it's John of the Cross fascinating book yeah uh, author unknown, basically, but um, yeah. which is good. It makes it even better. Mm. Uh, well, as with Lao Tzu, you know, we don't, we don't know anything about it. Know, it's yeah. all made up. We don't know much about that. Uh, Chang Tzu uh, uh, refined it uh, somewhat. Well, but, it, but anyway, yeah. you know, it, it, this is, seems to be a theme that you you go from, and even in Hinduism especially, you, you go from this very refined, almost cerebral or mystical path toward this unnameable God, uh, immutable God, infinite God. And you have to dumb it down in order for it to be useful. You've got to build buildings. You know, you, you, you've got to do, like in the ancient culture, a, a, uh, um, a practice. You have, you have to have, uh, you know, the, the um, what am I trying to say? There, there has to be a practical application. There's got to be an Oracle of Delphi. There, there has to be something to to allow the person to interact with this, and and that that thing can become a trap. Is the problem unless it's I, managed really well? So I'm not saying get rid of the things. I'm just saying have really good management that knows when to let go and when and when to hold on and when to change things you know which is what a good religion basically does it changes over time it adjusts itself it, it you know makes some kind of 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 um um adjustments to science to to, to social changes to you know and and corrects its own past you know yeah, we and, see that happening in, in in some cases that's what i'm, I'm saying about evolution that the religion yeah. shows us that you know because for example, with Judaism, because we now do have access to so many Babylonian ring seals, we know mm -hmm. that the original story of Adam and Eve, it, it's well represented in the Babylonian seals, that Adam and Eve are being invited into the garden by the serpent, who is the father god, on behalf of the mother god, who is the supreme god, to taste the dates because there weren't apples in that part of the world at that no, time yeah. to taste the dates of wisdom and this with time with and retelling becomes expulsion and mm -hmm. an apple you know as in snow white and the the serpent becomes a, a demonic figure rather than the father and the mother goddess disappears from the picture entirely right and we can this evolution, I mean, the second book of Kings has um, the king, I think, of Judea rather than Israel, but one or the other, who whose people find the book of the law, I don't think they mean the Alistair Crowley one, in, in the temple, 
and it says you're doing it all wrong and he overthrows the shrines he kills the priestesses and it's recorded in torah in the old testament right there and you can date it and the reason you can and he brings the patriarchal religion so this mm -hmm. is in i think 621 bc somewhere close to there and we can date it because the egyptian chronicles show them invading that part of the world at that time and killing Josiah, which was his reward for bringing Jehovah to the masses. That gives us a date before which the Jews do not appear to have been an essentially monotheistic people. We then get the invention probably of Moses and the Egyptian captivity. And this, this whole set of stories that are refined and made better and better, you know, the same way that Shakespeare got the Decameron and turned it into these incredible plays, but he didn't write any original stories. And so we can see these stories changing over time to suit the priesthood of the time. So after mm -hmm. the Babylonian captivity in what the fifth century BC, the, the Assyrians release all of the Hebrews. They say, we're just sick and tired of listening to these people. They never stop bloody talking about philosophical matters. Send them home. And a guy mm -hmm. called Ezra gives us really the beginning of modern Judaism. Interesting. So yeah. anything and everything, you know, we've become our history, our scientific history has become better and better. We've not found any of the, you know, Solomon's temple or any of the great palaces and things that are boasted about in the Old Testament. And it's you start coming to the thing, it's like, I hate to say this, and I am going to get into trouble. But it, it's like taking the Marvel comics and saying, right, this is our religion. Let's fit everything around. Well, you know, it, I think it's I think you're onto something. Because when you look at the Homeric myths, Iliad and the Odyssey, there were many Homers that refined that, that, that tale, it, it was a progression of, of of, of reciters and, mm, and people that corrected of things and added things, hundreds of years. So there was no just one Homer, just like there may have been not one Moses, you know, because this is the way people did things back then, but they put a name on it. They slapped the name on it, you know, just like, you know, modern Christianity slaps the name that Jesus inspired this particular gospel. There may have been one person that, that you know, as far as we know, that, that had a, a, a tremendous effect, a, a follower of John the Baptist on this but after he was crucified there was a retrofitting of imagery and retelling and retelling and suddenly you know we had gnostic versions we had mm. uh uh you know the pauline version we, you know you had Mars and the, version. the Ionine version where there is no childhood there is no virgin birth that none right, of right, right. Stuff, so, so all of which they, seems they, to be retrofitted as you say to fulfill right. prophecies in the bible yeah, to, to make something cohesive out of it. Like I was saying earlier, you know, people have something in their mind and, and rather than stay all alone within their own schizophrenic world, they want to share it and see what's convergent. Because that's one that's one uh, definition of truth is where information converges in yeah. social discourse, we accept that as the truth. Hmm. Not absolutely, but it, it's what we agree to. It comes to an agreement. And um you know, just like astrology, for instance, is a classic example. The Ptolemaic system still rules mm -hmm. most of astrology, and even though it's been thrown out the window since Copernicus. Yeah. Uh, but 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 it's, there's a consensus reality we call it. But but there's a convergence and an acceptance of this kind of thing. The same with the tarot and other occult things that that, that developed over time, and there's many versions of it. But there's a sort of a consensus. This is what we agree to, and then we work with it. And uh, I mean, this is what's difficult, I think, for a lot of people in their particular religions and cults to understand is that, hey, you know, you're you're full of flaws, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know, unless you start working it, whether it's you personally and your system outside of you, you're both are full of flaws, mm -hmm. and unless that's reworked and continually refined, it will collapse into decadence. You know, um, you got to keep continue to clean house all the time. If you don't, you'll be invaded with mice and roaches and 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 whatever. Yeah, which and, is basically and... what happens to these these uh, stilted religions like Scientology became stilted. Mm -hmm. You know, it it couldn't change once uh, Hubbard and his madness set it down. No, and and it it is regarded as inviolable scripture now, which is yes. rather difficult, as he contradicted almost everything that he said. Yeah.
somewhere yeah. and he said I've lost yeah, and this things, is the, the problem with the fundamentalist evangelicals that, that, that want to see the scripture as inerrant as if it's Moby Dick you know that's the way it was written and that's the way it has to be you know yeah. like it's some kind of a, a thing well it's the, 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 it's a living document it's it's not a a, 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 a a fictional novel which is set in time this is the way it's written this is the way it has to be um but the christianity isn't a novel and i think a lot of fundamentalists see it as such they think that it's a story much like moby dick mm. and you can't, can't change a word of it because then you will offend the author um and he'll and, sue you and you absolutely probably will these days <laughs> and, and and it comes down to a literalism you know the idea of fundamentalism of of interpreting the material literally and, and we come to some very serious problems there so when well, jesus, we've seen the serious problems come up you know over jesus over. says if your right eye offend the pluck it out if your right hand offend the cut it off i've not met a single christian who's done that no there's so, been some well what, well, well I'm, I'm there's or, origin heard, who, who cut his testicles some, off i'm aware of that, that well but. no well origin did but but schizophrenics in my day that I've heard stories of in hospitals because I've worked in it 25 years. One cut his hand off, mm. voices from his head saying, you you know, like God saying, you have to cut your hand off. It offends you. And that and kind of shows the, you the, what state of mind you need to be in to think right. that's a literal statement. And, and, and that's, we then, we then mm, have the whole sense of how much of this is metaphor, how much of this is are these moral tales you know you can't it's easier to get a rich man into the kingdom of heaven than to get a camel through the eye of a needle and whether the eye needles a gate into jerusalem or a literal needle doesn't really matter mm -hmm. because you know, my revelation in school at 13 was that i was being taught to make a big camel and try and shove it that would, was the objective of life to become rich to become powerful mm -hmm. i also like to say that and because this thought just struck me and it, it seems quite significant that devotional religions where you just accept what you're told and you now do, you know, you go and kiss the icons and crawl on all fours to a shrine a thousand miles away. You follow all of these rules. This is authoritarianism. This mm -hmm. is um, magical stuff is for me is psychopathic. It's the idea that you can control the forces of nature using your will. For, for me, that, that's a horrible notion because also it means that you're seeking to control other people without their consent. Harry is, Potter. Harry Potter, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> there, but there is, no, stuff. Yeah. there is no white magic because mm -hmm. it, all magic is an attempt to control others without their permission. You know, a love talisman to make somebody fall in love with you, what have you. So the magical stuff is dangerous there. The devotional stuff has put us in the mess we're in, where people just do as they're told. And in between is this mysticism, this idea mm -hmm. of you find it out for yourself, work out how to behave. And, you know, say the way that Baruch Spinoza managed to upset the Jewish community by asking questions and was expelled and lived on the yes. same street as Rembrandt, which is such, at the same time. What a thought, Spinoza and Rembrandt. You know. um, <laughs> The, the old, the, one of the most brilliant philosophers of all time and, and one of the greatest egomaniacs of all time, who was in fact right when he said he was the greatest painter in the world. But the, this sense of having to submit, you know, Islam, surrender. Now, mm -hmm. if it's surrendered to a benevolent force in the universe, I'm all for it. But, mm -hmm. And I think often it is. I mean, when I read um, Mavlavi, Rumi or Hafez, I feel that I am, you know, that much closer to, to whatever it is that's out there. These mm -hmm. men seem to have a tremendous insight into something quite beautiful and quite benevolent. But it's also said of Rumi that he he introduced the whirling dervish thing, which yeah. they, they still done for tourists to this day, where you put your um, gravestone on your head and twirl around until you get really dizzy. And it's said that he introduced this technique because it was forbidden both dancing and music were forbidden. And he wanted to show that these rules are to be broken. Okay. But there is then the sense that in every generation, you have to break them again, because you become set in, you know, the mm -hmm. customs and rituals of a past generation, which are no longer providing people with insight 
into the nature of life and reality and tolerance for others and goodness let's mm -hmm. you know unwind that word god it's cognate with the word good yeah they come from the same place and i fear that so much that people in trailing their putting their god on a lead and trying to trail them around they forget goodness that 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 fundamental mm -hmm. you know underpinning other people have said god is love and you know in in, in a sense we're arguing for cults to appear because it's a challenge to status quo it's a challenge to break up what's not good oh. about you know like for instance not good about the, the the basic church and you have some new preacher coming up thinking he's going to purify it and bring it back to the origin story of, of and, and we have thousands unite of all of humanity groups. under his banner and then you unite all of humanity and, and and then you have this grandiose leader claiming he's the new prophet or whatever you know so so it, it's a dangerous task and nietzsche said this nietzsche said this that um how did he put it um uh, that uh that you know we're, we're kind of born in chains but but it's not good to throw off your chains if you're not worthy of doing that you're better off staying in the tradition you're in and he meant that seriously you know huh. stay in christianity unless you are worthy of breaking free from it huh. and and doing something better you know so he, he was he was careful in that he wasn't just rejecting the old way he didn't want to reject it he rejected its calcification he rejected its its minimizing the value of of of, of the god and so you know, um, he warned people not to cast off their chains because you could end up in a worse mess. Yeah. And, uh, and yet uh, he, his whole thing was about casting off those chains. Yeah. Personally, the, the dragon thou, sh thou shalt not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, uh, they're, they're, I think there's something very interesting. What you, I mean, it's all very interesting what you just said, but this point about we'll get cults because we, we need disagreement. And it yeah. makes me think, well, there's nothing wrong with cults per se, with groups yeah. that have devotion to a particular leader or, or doctrine. And if we look at science, what we want is people who come along and disagree, that, that the method should be constantly challenging ideas to find something better. And a lot of it with religion is, what is your basic beginning point? Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with the Archbishop of Crete, we spent four or five hours together, absolutely brilliant man, Irenaeus absolutely wonderful man and once he'd realized that you know his miracle stories about christianity weren't going to work on me you know that i you know it's like i've in fact the exact story he told me i've been told by a muslim 10 years before you know about you pray and suddenly you get this stuff and it's like i'm really not interested in that i'm interested in how i live and he mm -hmm. so he said to me well what do you believe and, and i said well i i believe in compassion and I try to show it. And mm -hmm. I know the meaning of the word humility. And I hope one day to have some. And nothing much has changed in the, you know, the nine years intervening. I still feel that what is the beginning point for your belief? And my, my belief is, you know, as Charlie Chaplin and Einstein said, I'm a patriot of the human race. Mm -hmm. You know, I do not see myself as a white middle-class cis male and in this little box that that says you know who i am i i do not i i believe in equalism that that we should all have the same rights and opportunities but i believe fundamentally in being positive doing good things ameliorating the human condition and if we start there and then take our perception of the divine, whatever that is, whether it's personal or impersonal, and say, because I decided I couldn't worship the Christian God who was being presented to me because mm -hmm. he was a monster. Yeah. No, you know, it, it, all evil comes from the Lord. I think is is it Leviticus or Deuteronomy? There's this, yeah, just this one liner, all evil comes from the Lord. The idea, of course, of Satan, the opponent, Mm -hmm. is he, he comes up what three times in the old testament he's really not significant and yeah then, he's another developed concept you know he, he's, he's he's sort of he's become, an alter ego of god well the alter ego of the god in our mind yeah but, and this yeah. that idea of division becomes paramount in christianity with the invention mm -hmm. of hundreds of demons 
the renaming. You know, but, but what, what's interesting here is, and I think some preachers pick this out, you know, like let's use the, the, the Christian gospel, for instance. You know, you, you get these parables, which was a fascinating way to teach. Uh, and, and you get like the parable of the talents, and there's two versions of it. And, you know, and then someone gets one talent, someone gets five, another gets ten. And and it, it's very simply speaks to what is, you know, there are people born into this world who are blind or who end up crippled or who die young, you know, or who have very low IQ. I have for whatever low reason. IQ. Yeah. Um, you know, and I worked in an institute for, for uh, brain damaged autistic for two years when I was younger. And I understand what that is viscerally, you know, hands on. Yeah. people that are born into this state where some of them are just vegetables for 15 years until they die, mm. you know, uh, and people help to keep them alive. Yes. You know, so, uh, but some are given a little bit, some are given more and and, other, and and what's expected of us. And this is the idea where the good comes in is to do better with what we have. Mm. The parable I think works very well. And I think I've used it in, in exit counseling cases to show that your group is really not allowing you to exploit your talents, who you are. You know, if you're in a Christian type group, what, you know, what are you doing there? What are you, are you, you know, you, you buried your talents into this small group and it's exploiting it and no one else benefits from it, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, you know, you get someone like a Charles Darwin, who's barely a believer, but he puts his talent to incredible use. Mm. He took a risk, uh, you know, and, and, and he came up with something which is a valuable scientific mm. idea, theory, if you will, mm. that's become extremely useful for other scientists to build on and to use. You know, so in a sense, that's what that parable to me is talking about. It, it's, it's taking what you have and, and doing the best you can with it and increasing, you know, with, with whatever circumstances you're under if, if you're can and you know but but if but if you're in a, a nation like north, north korea the whole thing oppresses that ability mm. to, to to flourish as aristotle would say mm. you know so so in a way the parable of the talents is like aristotle's idea of flourishing that's the purpose of life mm. eudaimonia and so uh you know th that's what i think the whole thing comes down to in, in the sense of, of god is is what how do you use God in order to allow yourself and other people to flourish? Mm. Even people that don't believe in your God. Yeah. How, how you do know. you, how do you, I mean, I've, I've started thinking in, in quite simple, almost simplistic terms that the people are pro-social, anti-social, and the vast majority are asocial. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to have that motivation, if you want to be religious, then start by being pro-social, start by, you know, by, by wanting to do good for others. I, I'm often asked about therapy. I'm not a counselor, but I've, I've helped about 600 people in their recovery from, particularly from Scientology, but from one or two other groups as well. And it's it sort of, so people will say, well, what, what, is it, what, what is the vital element of that? And for me, the vital element is I like people. And when I meet people who are counselors because they have some narcissistic urge or they want, you know, they want to be adulated or they tried to solve a problem using a therapy, believe they have solved it and now have to use that therapy on everybody else because they mm -hmm. haven't really solved it, that there is something that's a therapeutic personality and it boils down to, do you like people? And I think if you don't like people, then your religion will be a bad thing, whatever it is, because you will use it to hurt others. Whereas yeah. if you like people, then, and have compassion, have some fellow feeling. Let, let me build on this because this yeah. is our problem with the narcissistic leader is they like people that like them. Yeah. So there's liking is conditional. Yeah. In, in those kinds of groups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as Alex Stain points out, you get a disorganized attachment where you go to the, the leader both for, for praise and punishment, and yeah, you don't yeah, know which one you're going that. to get. Yeah. 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 I just heard her, one of her talks recently. Yeah. 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 John, I've got to go in a few minutes here. Okay. Um, I go see my mom. You have anything more profound to say? 
<laughs> God, no, not at all. No, uh, let's all let's just throw one Spaniard in the works, as John Lennon had it, um, which is Stephen Hawking. That Hawking, okay. Hawking's famous bet that when the background microwave radiation was discovered, and it was found that it wasn't, in fact, uh, the pigeons mating in the um, the uh, telescope, the radio telescope, but they'd actually found that this mm -hmm. you could measure the same signal in all directions, which made it possible to date the Big Bang. And at this point, Hawking won a bet, which I think was a subscription to Playboy magazine. These are old misogynistic days when he made made this bet, probably. And because he said, well, that means that God could exist. And the funny thing was that the week that that came out, which was back in the 90s, I think, you know, way back um, in, you know, in another century, I was reading a book by a Methodist minister who was seeking to say that, in fact, steady state would be a proof of the existence of God. So the only two theories we have, both of them are capable of, of proving the existence of, of a divine force. Um, I think the underlying message and the thing you know, that we've been talking about is, is about your moral intentions. And if you justify mm -hmm. harming others through your religion, or if you refuse to listen to other people, I sat, my, I was sat in a room with some friends and um, we, we were about to talk to the parents of a, of a Scientologist and they were Christians, they're born again Christians. And I started talking about the historicity of Christ, what we do and don't know. And we don't know anything fundamentally. We've just got Josephus and and that's a questionable text, the Jewish wars. But there's nothing else that's right. contemporary other than what was written down by, by John and the followers of Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Um, and the, the guy's wife stopped him and said, you mustn't contend with scripture. And the other right. guy in the room, and I'm going to name him, bless him, Dieter Roman, the wonderful oh, German yeah. psychologist yeah. said, Here's the deer. Yeah, absolutely. He himself at the time was a Christian, but he looked at, at my friends and he said, you are starting to sound like cult members. And that point where you can't discuss something, it's too emotional mm -hmm. because your certainties are being shaken. It's causing cognitive dissonance. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to be able to have conversations and to not feel frightened yeah. that you know, the, the demon is, is you know, influencing you. Right. This is why my, my most favorite philosopher has been uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, 19th century. He was the, considered the founder of pragmatism, although he didn't call it that. But he said that the first rule of reason is to not block the way of inquiry. Mm. You know, so that is one, his yeah. path toward that. Yeah. And uh, so when you find a group blocking the way of inquiry, you've got mm. cult flags flying. Yeah. Absolutely. Freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of anything, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Anyway. Wonderful talking with you. And um, yeah, same here. Yeah, let's very get good. Together uh, in a any, anyway, so uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, show them the book. Uh, yep. We'll now sell, them, 40 we'll sell them the book. <laughs> okay. Brandy. Take care. Yeah. Bye, John. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.